Well, let's get started. Thank you everybody for joining. This is Jason Key in Boston. Um, and today we're going to hear about high throughput in situ cryo EM of hematopoietic differentiation. So Johannes Elfrick is joining us from Nico Gregori's lab right down the road in, uh, in Worcester here in Massachusetts. So uh, go ahead and share your screen uh, <clears throat> while he's sharing. If you have any questions during the uh, talk, you can send them by chat. We'll probably save all those to the end. There'll be some time at the end also to ask your questions directly. So uh, you can save your question to the end if you'd rather, but you can also send it by chat. If it's something that uh, we need to clarify or um, interrupt on the fly, I'll interject, but otherwise we'll try and save them till the end. So uh, Johannes, whenever you're ready. All right, great. Thanks. Uh, hi, everybody. Thanks so much for giving me the chance to talk. Um, and so what I want to talk about is some ideas we have how to um, image, uh, in our case, hematopoietic cells um, with cryem in a more um, high throughput fashion. So, um, so um, kind of what I want to talk about, I'll quickly introduce hematopoiesis if you're not familiar with it, but I assume most people here are interested in, in more in methods. So I'll try to keep it short, more to give you an idea of um, what we want to achieve. And then I'll talk about um, how we have been doing cryo-EM of hematopoietic cells and use that to introduce like the two ways we are imaging cells. Um, the first one is uh, cryo-electron tomography and the other method is 2D template matching. And then I will segue into basically the new approach we have been developing to image, which we call FOWL for um, fast observation of um, whole lamella. So um, to get started, so hematopoiesis is the process in which um, all the cells in your blood are um, generated from the T and B cells of the immune system to the neutrophils of the innate systems and red blood cells and platelets. And um, all these cells are generated from uh, hematopoietic stem cells that reside in your bone marrow. So um, the classic idea of hematopoiesis is, is that there's one, this master stem cell that has the potential to differentiate in all the different cells. And then there are more specialized progenitors that can only differentiate into a certain lineage. And the way we used to think about it is that um, the, the stem cell can basically divide itself to regenerate itself. But at some point it will divide and differentiate. And at that point it will make a decision. Should I become a myeloid cell, a lymphoid cell? And then it will make a further decision. Will I become a natural killer cell or a lymphocyte and so on. But uh, it turns out that in newer experiments where people have been very nice lineage tracing experiments, the picture is more muddy. It seems there's like a pool of uh, stem cells. Some have the potential to differentiate into all the cells. Some differentiate into more specific subsets. But it was it's quite striking that if you clone one of these cells, they go give rise to the same percentage of uh, final cells. For example, one progenitor might generate 50% neutrophils and 50% eosinophils, and another one might generate 60% T cells, 40% B cells. And what is striking about this is you transplant these cells into different animals and have different conditions, that ratio doesn't change. So there seems to be something intrinsic in these cells that basically decides their future fate. And so um, one major question in the field is how can we basically analyze the current state of a stem cell that um, decides its future fate. And the main method that people uh, have been using for that, and it's very popular right now, of course, is uh, single cell RNA sequencing. But we were wondering if we could use um, basically what people call visual proteomics to um, see if we can uh, map state of cells to fate. And visual proteomics is basically a fancy word of taking images of cells with cryoEM and doing some sort of quantitative analysis that basically uh, quantifies the abundance and locations of biomolecules in that cell. And of course, this is a very lofty goal. And so um, to start out with, um, 
we used a model system that was generated by our collaborators, uh, David Skadden at HMS. And they have this nifty uh, cell system, which is a mouse cell line that expresses a transcription factor that keeps it basically progenitor-like under the control of the estrogen receptor. So if you culture these cells in the presence of estrogen, they will divide and um, stay progenitor-like. But once you withdraw estrogen, they kind of differentiate out into a final blood cells. And the clone we have um, mostly differentiates out into neutrophils. And so you can um, do this beautiful experiment where you um, take um, cells at different time points after differentiation, plunge freeze them, and then you can fit mill them and image them with cryoEM to basically uh, for us to start developing ways to like quantify the changes in cellular state by um, cryoEM. And so um, the changes, because this is such a well characterized system, we know some of these changes already. So it's great to verify that our system is working. And so the two major changes are is that the nucleus uh, gets this crazy globular um, uh, appearance, while in the progenitor it's nice and round. And the other one is the emergence of intracellular granules that contain um, mostly toxic stuff that a neutrophil will secrete to kill bacteria, for example. So um, um, first, um, some technical details. So what we have to do in order to image these cells is um, they're normally way too thick to image them by cryoEM. So um, I assume most of you are familiar with um, this technique called focus ion beam milling, where you can um, put your cells on a grid. And that is very nice for hematopoietic cells. Normally you would culture mammalian cells on a grid, but because they're blood cells, they grow in suspension. So we can just pipe at them on a grid and then plunge freeze it. And then um, um, we put it in the Aquilos, which is a focused ion beam SEM microscope where you can basically come in from the side and use an ion beam to I have this movie playing to basically cut out a very thin slice of the cell that you typically want to get uh, to about 200 nanometers of thickness so electrons can easily penetrate it. And so um, if we do that with undifferentiated cells and differentiated cells, um, these are, um, so we call the little slab we cut out lamella. So these are two lamella, one from an undifferentiated cell and one from a differentiated cell. And even from this kind of low magnification overview, you can appreciate the, the changes we were inspecting. Initially, there's one big nucleus with then um, cytoplasm that's mostly not filled with membranous organelles, just um, a few mitochondria. And after differentiation, we get these nice um, globular nucleus and the cytosol becomes filled with all kinds of like membranous vesicles and granules. Um, so then um, our next step was to figure out how to image these lamella in a way that will allow us to quantify certain parameters of the cells. Um, so the first method um, is tomography, where we basically um, choose a region on the lamella image it under higher magnification and then uh, tilt the stage as we go. So we collect an image from all the different angles and this will allow us to basically reconstruct a 3D volume of the electron density um, at, that, um, at that location. Um, so um, here is, um, an example of what you will get. So this is an XY slice from a tomogram from that location. And here's a slice from the side. And what you normally very easily can nicely visualize are, are the membranes. And, but you can also um, see um, some larger biomolecules. And of course, nowadays, um, there have been lots of algorithms that you can do to then um, average some of these um, molecule in a process called subtomogram averaging to um, nowadays, even get um, uh, near atomic resolution structures. But um, for us, the first thing uh, we wanted to do is to basically use this to basically quantify the emergence of granules. So 
if you have a nice algorithm that can segment out these membranes, you could quantify the distribution of sizes. And we were quite struck that we see so many granules where there seems to be a smaller vesicle and bigger vesicles, and they seem to differ in their electron density. So this would all be really nice to um, get like a quantitative sense of these changes in the cell as it's differentiating. But um, one problem we struggled with is um, that, yeah, you normally have to choose a sub area of your lamella where to collect. And if you're like me, you will normally always click on uh, what seems the most interesting to you, right? So we are already biasing, so to say, our uh, basically visualization of the cell. Um, then um, the other method um, that we were planning to use is um, 2D template matching. And so what we do there is um, we only take a single exposure um, of a site of interest. And normally um, with a bit more exposure, normally about 30 electrons per angstrom squared and at low to focus to kind of maximize the high resolution signal um, that's in there. And then we choose um, a, a molecule of interest. Uh, at the moment, we're very interested in, in the ribosome and then basically um, rotate it around and calculate all different projections and then calculate the cross correlation of all these projections at all possible location in this micrograph. And um, if we um, find uh, a significant cross correlation, we basically mark down that location and the orientation of the molecule. And so with these results, we can basically build up a 3D model of the location and orientation of this uh, molecule in 3D space. And um, so we get very accurate X and Y information. And we actually can even get the um, height or the Z position of the molecule in the lamella by basically varying the uh, the focus of the projection. And it turns out the cross correlation is very sensitive to that. So you get um, fairly accurate um, Z positions. So um, this method has been described in this 2017 paper by uh, Peter Rickauer. But um, more recently, uh, Bronwyn and Ben from our lab have uh, published this really nice paper uh, basically describing one. Ben made a very nice GPU accelerated um, implementation of this in system. So it's not feasible to do this on a lot of images. And then uh, Bronwyn really has been driving, um, yeah, finding ribosome this well in, in cells. And in this paper, they did a very nice comparison of 2D template matching to kind of the kind of data you would get from subtomogram averaging. And so I won't go into too much what are the advantages and disadvantages, but if you're interested in that, I would really encourage you to check out that, that paper. Um, so um, when we apply this um, to our cells, um, one thing that was very striking to me is, in, so in this lamella, I again, um, I take exposures at various locations and then uh, basically searched for the large subunit of the mammalian ribosome. And as you expect, you get no matches if that location ends up in the nucleus because there should be no mature ribosomes in the nucleus but in the cytosol, you get very robustly matches. But on this lamella, we got uh, this one location where we just got an order of magnitude uh, more matches than we uh, normally observe. And if you look at this in a 3D model, um, it turns out in that region, ribosomes were really, really, really densely packed. And that is very interesting to us because um, that might kind of hint towards um, a mechanism of basically translational control that could be very important in differentiation that basically um, either um, locally constrains ribosomes with specific transcripts, or um, maybe these ribosomes are uh, held in a stalled state to um, not allow them to do any translation. So um, we were very interested in, in, in studying this. The problem, of course, is um, to really study this, you need an N of more than one. And it, in this lamella, it was basically dumb luck that I clicked on this particular location. And 
collected an exposure there, but um, if I hadn't, we would have missed that. And I haven't seen anything in any of the other lamellas I imaged, but of course, I don't know, did I just not choose the right location? And we actually would see these kind of local concentration gradients of ribosomes more often, but we're just not, we're missing them. So um, that really uh, uh, made me think why it is that in cryo -EM we basically have to decide where to collect um, on a lamella. And um, the reason mostly comes down to like our main, main uh, I want to say enemy or limiting factor, which is radiation damage. So if on a lamella um, we have uh, a site of interest, we would um, basically expose this area with an electron beam that's just large enough to basically nicely cover um, our detector. So we can get a nice even illumination of the detector to get uh, a nice image. Um, of course, uh, a problem with that that we take into account is that on this region outside of the detector, we are exposing the lamella to electrons and irradiating the sample and basically destroying all the high resolution information, but we don't get any image, um, which basically makes it impossible to get an image everywhere. And furthermore, normally we expose a second area um, close to the primary area, and that is used to um, ensure that we have the right focus and in case of tomography to uh, track our region of interest as we are tilting the sample. And of course, here also you're destroying high resolution information, but you don't get any image for it. And you can be clever about this and basically set it up so that this area always coincides with an area you have imaged before. But in practice, that means that you spend a long time in front of the microscope, basically planning out where do you collect an image, where will you focus, and whereas what you actually really want is an image of everything. There should be no decision involved. So how can we get towards a system where we basically get an image of the whole lamella? So the first thing we have to do is to avoid basically wasting electrons where we don't get an image, is to focus the beam on our detector. So every electron that hits a sample hits our detector. And um, there are two different things you can do is when you normally do it, at least on a thermo Fisher scope, you get these Fresnel lenses um, around the edge of the, of the beam, which are caused by the C2 aperture not being in the focal plane. And um, what you can do is um, you can basically change your focal plane to get the C2 aperture in focus and then move your sample to basically get the right focus on your sample again. Um, but the problem is then your sample is no longer aligned to the tilt axis. Thermo Fisher now offers an upgrade where they basically um, change that, but um, we don't have that yet. So I have been kind of mixing and matching the two. So the changing the sample off of the tilt axis is no problem really if you don't plan on tilting the stage, but in tomography um, that, that causes problems. So in the rest, I will show basically 50-50 of the two kinds of data as I've been exploring um, how best to do this. So um, the next step is to basically now um, expose the lamella everywhere using the small beam. So we basically lay out a even grid of imaging position on the lamella that will expose every area. And then we make the microscope go through a cycle. Beam image shift. So um, in order to image these, we will not uh, move the stage, but we will instead use the beam image shift of the microscope to very quickly direct it to take an image there. So we beam image shift there, take the image, and then um, we save the image. And then we use um, the ton rings to estimate the defocus at that location. And if that is off from the, the focus we desire, we will adjust the focus. And then if we basically move through the sample in like a um, pattern, we will always adjust the focus locally. So our next exposure should be in focus. 
So that way we avoid having to have the secondary area where we um, basically irradiate the sample without getting an image out of it. And so the whole thing um, is fairly fast. You would think it's faster because the individual exposures take normally less than a second, but you spend for every image quite a bit of time estimating the defocus from the CTF. So um, in my first test, it takes roughly two hours to image a seven by 10 micron lamella with, um, so for template matching, we know I normally use a pixel size of 1.5 angstroms and you end up having to take about 500 positions. So you have to do this um, loop 500 times. So um, with these images, there are some um, things you have to do special when you process them. One thing is when you do try to do motion correction, you have this beam edge in the image, um, then basically the motion correction doesn't know if it should correct for the motion of the image or of the edges of the beam. So in order to get a good estimation of the sample movement, you have to box out a central area that does not contain the beam images. And you can see um, if we determine shifts from that box out areas, we see that there was actually a lot more sample motion than what was estimated when we just uh, did this on the whole image. And so um, what um, I made a special Umbler version that basically estimates sample movement on the central area, but then calculates back some from the complete image. Um, the next um, kind of special artifact you have to deal with is that the beam edges in cross correlation uh, calculations cause like an artificial high signal just because it's such a strong contrast feature. So if you just naively run 2D template matching on these images, you get false matches um, basically on the edge. So um, what we do is we just fill the dark area with uh, Gaussian noise and then um, you very nicely get rid of that and only get true matches um, of ribosome locations. So um, yeah, this is uh, an example of, of a lamella where I took about um, 450 um, individual exposures in this hexagonal pattern um, with like parameters optimal for 2D template matching and ran uh, 2D template matching on each of these images and then basically projected it back in the right location, which we know because we know the beam image shift we applied for each image. And that way we basically then get back the location of every ribosome in this whole lamella. So in this lamella, every red dot is an individual ribosome. And so if you zoom in, um, yeah, just remember every ribosome location, it's not just the location of the ribosome, we get information of uh, its Z position and the orientation. So it's very exciting now for us to use um, this basically comprehensive atlas of um, ribosome position orientations to make statistical arguments of are the ribosomes in polysomes, are they interacting with certain organelles? Um, yes, one thing, uh, a bit of a caveat, this is still uh, computationally very, very expensive. Um, uh, this is a huge, uh, this is um, more than a billion pixels in this image, and we have to calculate cross correlations everywhere. So for this lamella, just the matching took seven days on 32 like current generation GPUs, but um, it is feasible and we think it will, will get faster. Um, of course, what would be really nice if we analyze that, if we at the same time also had a tomogram, a tomographic reconstructions of all these structures. We can, we can see that there's a mitochondrion here in this um, like low magnification image, but it would be great to have a 3D reconstructions of the membranes. So we can really make quantitative uh, statements about distances and relative orientations of the ribosome to these organelles. So the next thing I really want to try if I can use the same approach basically to make tomograms of basically the whole lamella at high resolution. So um, in order to do that, first naively thought I'd do the exact same thing um, with minor changes. I will collect a bit shorter exposure instead of 30 electrons per angstrom, three electrons. 
higher the focus, so we can see membranes better, four to five microns, and then maybe slightly lower magnification, because um, yeah, normally um, we are not that reliant on the high resolution information. And then I take all these exposures, tilt the stage a bit, and repeat. And then later on, I just have to fuse these exposures together, and I have a tilt series of the whole tomogram uh, of the whole lamella, and we'll be able to calculate a tomogram, right? Um, so the first thing I had to figure out is to stitch these exposures uh, together to get, basically reduce or get rid of all these artifacts that would make it very hard to align individual tilt images. So um, the first thing to do was to, so this is, um, there are fringes in these images. So the first thing was to just nicely mask these away so we only um, add together the nicely exposed areas. But even then, uh, you might realize that in these areas where there's overlap, um, so here you can nicely see the membranes where here they kind of blur away. So the, the relative orientation is fairly good, but it's not perfect. So in order to fix that, um, I basically, for each pair of adjacent exposures, I would um, mask out the area of overlap and then um, calculate the cross correlation, which um, uh, actually works surprisingly well. And then based on this corrected shift between the two images, I can recalculate new global positions for each exposure that should um, make the overlap more seamless. So now I'm kind of going back and forth uh, for correction and after correction, and you can see how that nicely restores um, all this information in the overlap areas. And all that is to do now is to basically correct for the fact that um, these areas have been exposed twice or uh, sometimes three times. And if we do that, we basically get back uh, a seamless image um, that is still uh, at high resolution, at, for example, two angstrom pixel size, but encompasses a much larger area. And um, yeah, then we do the same thing at um, a variety of tilts and we have a tilt series of a, of a whole lamella. Um, so, um, so far I haven't been completely successful yet of reconstructing tomograms from that. It's just tilt series with a billion pixels um, get hard to manage and my first naive approach of just um, binning them by a large amount, um, it is harder than you think. And I think it mostly um, has something to do with the lamella not being very precise planes. Um, so it's really hard to reconstruct it into one uh, continuous volume. And it might also be that the lamella warps between the individual exposures. So um, I'm sure it should be possible to do this, but um, I'm not quite there yet. Um, the other issue is you might notice that that's not a very extensive tilt series. I'm only tilting plus minus 15 degrees here. And the reason for that is it, it takes a long time to collect this. Um, so um, um, just remember, we have to go through this um, uh, loop. And um, initially, I said it takes about two hours to collect the whole tilt series. Now, if you have to do that for 30 tilt angles, um, you're looking at way more than 24 hours to collect a whole tilt series. And at that point, you cannot longer call this fast, right? So, um, and the other problem is that oftentimes you get um, somewhat artifacts if there are contamination in the way of the beam, um, which meant that I had to come up with a more um, robust way of uh, basically collecting that and also a lot more faster. And so um, the way I'm doing this now is, is um, so I'm still assembling um, all these imaging positions and I choose uh, 10 distributed positions that I will use to basically pre-calibrate the defocus. And I will take an exposure at each of these locations and then based off the measured defocus of these exposures, calculate uh, the position of this particular location on the on the axis of the microscope 
And as you can see, if you plot this height as a function of the image shift, um, you get very nice planes. And as you um, tilt the stage, you basically tilt the tilt the plane. So this just um, basically the plane represents the position of the lamella in, in the microscope. And so now for every position, you can just um, from this plane calculate what um, what you set the focus of the microscope to. And um, you basically don't have for every exposure have to adjust the, uh, the, the focus. So um, we basically can get rid of these five seconds in the loop. And, um, but unfortunately that only gives us about twofold um, speed up because it still takes a lot of time uh, at least for the K3 to basically end an exposure and save the movie to disk. So in order to overcome this, um, there's now very nice approaches to collect tilt series faster where you basically keep the camera on and um, keep exposing the camera as you tilt the stage. And so you only collect one movie um, and it's a lot faster. And so I've been using the same thing. So now I'm basically just starting the camera and then rapidly beam image shifting to every location, unblank and blank the beam, and then basically have the loop in there. So for every position, I really only need that one second or half a second that the exposure actually takes. And then saving that movie to disk will take a bit longer, but it's still quite a massive speed up you get from that. And so more recently, I have been able to collect um, like full tilt series of 35 tilts in about four hours, which I think is a reasonable amount of time. So um, this is an example of what a movie now will look where you basically, um, every frame switches between the positions. Um, I'm now in the process of writing the code that basically divides this back up into individual movies to basically figure out for each frame at which beam image shift position that was taken. And turns out that is a bit harder problem than you initially think because if you take 7,000 individual exposures, something will go off at some point and you kind of need to robustly deal with that. But um, I'm quite confident that you should be able in maybe six hours of complete time, collect data for 2D template matching and a full tomogram afterwards of a whole lamella. So um, why would you want to do that? And why might you not want to do that? So I think this um, strategy to acquire the data, which we call FOWL, is definitely um, warranted if you want to image the whole lamella. And I think for a lot of cell biology questions, that's what you want to do. You want all the information. I think it's also important if you want unbiased imaging of your lamella, so you don't get some inherent bias where you image certain features more often than they actually appear. And I think it's also great if you want to fully automate your data acquisition because um, um, you no longer have to like choose sites and think about where do you focus or not. You just point at the lamella and the thing goes. And even if due to the tilt contamination come into view, it will still image all of it. And some areas might be blocked. Yet you will get all the imageable area of the lamella out of it afterwards. Um, some reasons why you might not want to do this is, for example, if your samples are supported by holy carbon, in which case you just would spend a lot of time imaging carbon, and that's probably not efficient. Um, you might also not want to do that if you just want as much data as possible, because you still, you're not using your whole detector um, and you're collecting some areas twice. You might actually get more data if you speed, if you take separate exposures where you cover the whole camera. But of course, that's only the case if you have an unlimited supply of lamella. And um, I think you can image lamella faster than you can make them. So that might not be the case. And of course, you don't want to do that if you're interested in a very specific feature of a cell, in which case you don't want to image everything else. But that also is the case if you really know where it is in the lamella, right? So if you have very good clam, for example, but if you don't, it might still be very useful to, in the beginning, image the whole lamella and then later out, figure out where it is. So, um, um, of 
course, you might have got the impression that there's a lot of software that basically needs to be generated to make this workflow as seamless as possible. So um, this is my plan right now, how I will basically distribute these software tools. Like one thing is a plugin for Chimera X that I've been developing that basically allows you to analyze 2D template matching results in 3D. So it reads everything directly out of the system database and you can color images by their cross correlation score. And I hope that that in the future will enable to basically analyze these positions together with any tomographic reconstructions. Um, the next thing is the acquisition script um, to, to get the data. And so uh, David Masternati was uh, kind enough to recently uh, implement um, basically a Python interface to Serial EM. And I've been making extensive use of that to create basically a set of Python functions that will um, do fairly automatically all the individual steps you will do. Um, calculate um, your grid and then uh, doing all the defocus calibrations and everything that's to do with it. And right now I'm basically using it from a Jupyter notebook, which is really great as I'm developing thing to do diagnostic plots, but I don't see why in the future this can be a very simple GUI applications where you just have to basically paint in which area you want to um, acquire and then everything happens automatically. And then the post-processing, um, the plan is to all integrate that into, into system, which is like a proven platform for cryo and processing. And so in the future, it will have the Umbler version you need to deal with the beam edges. And um, I'm working on introducing some functions that will help with assembling the tilt series and all these various steps. So um, then I'll just briefly acknowledge the people who made all this possible, uh, mostly Nico, who has allowed me to go, go down that way and then Ben and Bronwyn have been hugely helpful in that. Ben, who has been yeah, developing the GPU-based um, acceleration of template matching and who is now working on ways to make cross-correlations a lot faster, which I think would really help in this approach because it takes a lot of time to assemble all these exposures together. And Bronwyn, who has been really pushing the whole idea of using 2D template matching to find molecules and, and cells. And the whole lab is... Um, a great environment and everybody has been really helpful in, in discussing, discussing things and idea. And then the Scadden lab, um, who has been um, basically very helpful in discussions about the biology and especially Julia, who has provided me with cells. Uh, Chen, who runs the local uh, cryo facility and Kang Kang and Krishna on the ground. And yeah, this all is only possible if you have an excellent, well-working microscope. And we're very lucky to have that here. And then Tim Grant is um, the mastermind my system and has been helping me out in implementing every event in system. So yeah, with that, thanks so much for listening and I'll be happy to answer any questions. Questions, so uh, you can raise your hand with the reactions button. There's a raise hand uh, option. So, uh, and then I can promote you to the top and we can unmute. So let's see, so we've got a few here. Nope. No, I think those maybe were applause questions. Go ahead. There we go. Questions. Gabriela had a question, so uh, I'll ask her. Yep. Uh, hold on, we have got Vasily here. Hold on, one second. Uh, ahead, yeah. Sorry. Can you hear me? Um, yeah. Yeah. Yes. Or someone else was asking, or? No, go, go ahead. ahead. Yep. OK, go thank ahead. you. So very nice talk. So I was just want to ask, uh, so in this uh, Rigauer paper, they first said that defocus uh, should be really low uh, for high uh, precision location of particles. But then in this last paper from uh, Lucas, they told that it actually doesn't matter. But you told again that the defocus should be not that high. So what, what's your take on it? You know, um, I mean, of course, it's, it might be different for every sample, right? Um, but um, in, in practice, I feel like it is very hard to control the defocus that well anyway. So I think everything between half a micron and one micron, you're fine. Um, 
So I don't think it, the reliance on low to focus is as strong as we initially thought. You can definitely match very well at data that's at one micron to focus and even higher, which is sometimes nice because it's easier to maintain a higher to focus uh, and you get more contrast from the image. But of course, um, it is quite hard to get a true test on whether how much better a low to focus is because, because of radiation damage, we can never image the same area twice. So we cannot image the exact same sample with low to focus and high to focus and really figure out how much better it would be. So I think my overall take is um, not to worry about it too much. As long as you are between half a micron and one micron, you're probably fine. All right. And so I also wanted to ask, so I remember this, this uh, method, uh, this template matching is like based on high um, frequencies, right? But so you told that you have uh, uh, false positives on the edge where it's like high intensity uh, objects, but this is like mostly for low resolution things, right? So like this is for low high uh, frequencies, yeah. template matching mostly typical. Yes. I mean, that it relies on high resolution is more of an overall statement. Of course, it can be horribly overrun by just the drastic amount of contrast that is there from an edge that is completely unusual. The other thing is you also have to remember an edge is a very high resolution feature. It's like the Fourier transform of an edge will cover all frequency ranges. So um, yeah, we haven't really looked too much into what, what's the reason behind the edge giving these spurious results. It might also have to do, there is um, a normalization step of the cross correlations we, we do in between. That might be what gets really affected. But we in practice just have tried to get rid of that and not really worried about it too much. Mm -hmm. Thanks. And so my final question is that like in the last paper, there was really nicely shown that you can locate ribosomes and get the poses, but there was no like uh, successive alignment. So how far you can go with such, uh, like can you, if you do subtomogram averaging then, how, high, how far you can go in terms of resolution? Uh, that is a good question. The reason why we don't do any refinement is because we have already have that refinement, right? In a refinement, you would very finely change the orientation of your reference and compare that with your image, which is precisely what we're doing in the first place. So your data is already post-refinement. The problem, if you want to reconstruct from that is, um, of course, you will be, have horrible template bias. Um, the whole Einstein from noise problem, this is exactly what you run into. So if you were just naively reconstruct this, you would get back your template. Um, of course, there might be some, there is very extensive literature, mostly from X-ray crystallography, right? People have thought about this and about ways to get rid of that template bias. So it might be something um, you could do and basically get, I think, very high resolution reconstructions from that data. But um, we're not really there yet to confidently uh, present that and say that this is all without template bias. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Any other questions? Feel free to raise your hand. Jason, yeah. there's one in the chat for you, if you can read it. All right, cool. I'm gonna uh, let Pete go right ahead and then I'll jump over to the chat. Yeah, thanks. Great talk. Um, I have a question about the, the image stitching and electron dose. Mm -hmm. So it, it seems like it seems like it could be a situation where voxels that are in the overlapping region would have information where they're from multiple images and so they have different electron doses and potentially different radiation damage. And so I guess a multi-part question, how would you notice if that was a problem? Is it feasible to correct? And is it something, is, is there any sense about if this is a, a realistic real world problem at the moment? Yes, um, I've worried about that quite a bit. So um, the one thing that I'm kind of hoping what will end is because as you tilt the stage, these overlap regions will basically hit different areas of your sample. So when you reconstruct, everything will kind of average out and every voxel basically in the end effectively at the same dose. Um, but that might not be the case. Um, um, yeah, so I'm not really there yet where I can really say what the solution is, but um, my hope is that at least for initial 
tomogram reconstructions, the artifacts from that will be small enough that they won't hinder like annotation of ultrastructure and also not um, potential particle picking for subtomogram reconstructions. Then when you get to high resolution and do subtomogram, of course, the strategy might change because then you would basically box out the particles from the individual tilt images uh, and submit them for refinement. And then it would just be that for some particles, you have two exposures at the same tilt angle, which once you start averaging thousands of particles, I think should not be too big of a problem. Okay, thank you. We had a question from uh, Gabrielle. Let me see if I can, uh, you should be able to mute. Otherwise I can ask your question. She might not be able to. I, I see a question here from Jason. Well, well hey, let's, oh, hold on one second. All right, so Gabrielle said she can't unmute, but um, she had a question. So I was just gonna grab hers. In regards to the sample with the cluster of the ribosomes, uh, what were the growth conditions that might have caused that or phase of differentiation? Also, since you've been employing the mastering method, have you seen any more ribosome clustering? Um, second question, of course, I haven't seen any more ribosome clusters. Um, but then again, um, I have been mostly focused on basically the mechanistic aspects of taking more images and haven't done too many template matching. So I hope I will see more soon. As for growth conditions, I mean, it is fairly artificial. We grow them in um, fairly standard, um, um, it's not DMEM, but standard uh, media with FBS. So of course um, it's a uh, somewhat um, artificial results. I, I observed them in like a fairly differentiated cell where I think the state should be close that to a neutrophil. Of course, we don't know how much these cells after differentiation really resemble an in vivo neutrophil. But um, the kind of nice thing I think is what you could do, you can always go back and try to extract these cells um, from animals and um, purify them by cell sorting and then get them on a grid and then later on really validate things you see in like the artificial cell culture system. That thing is a big advantage of the hematopoietic system that potentially actual cells from animals are, are available and are feasible to look at by cryo-EM. Johannes, what, what, what are you guys doing to kind of align it with a single cell sequencing? Because you mentioned this, this could be alternative approach. Do you do, do controls? Do you do advision to kind of demonstrate that this indeed, uh, I guess, is perhaps more <laughs> time consuming, right? But like it could be yeah. powerful, right? So we're just wondering. Yeah, I mean, um, one thing you could just uh, in general say is if you see, for example, if you saw drastic increase of a particular ribosomal subunit, you could ask, do you see a corresponding increase of that transcript in single cell data? Of course, it would be nice if we could basically fit mill a cell and somehow subject the resuming cell to single cell sequencing afterwards, basically get the both imaging on the same cell. But since we're basically vaporizing most of it, that's gonna be hard. Maybe we have to kind of go back to like a mechanical slicing up cells again, and then we could potentially get one slice for cryoEM, one for sequencing. But yeah, right now that's like fun things to think about, but um, we don't have any concrete plans to really align it. Uh, you were not able to do the reconstruction of the full tomograms. Would it be possible to skip the tomogram reconstruction and go straight to subtilt reconstruction? by using the pre-computed XYZ coordinates of the individual objects and then extracting subregions around those coordinates and reconstructing the subregion alone. Yeah, that would be very interesting to try. Um, of course, you still have to very accurately then align the individual tilt images to each other. So you can basically extrapolate the XYZ position into XY positions in every tilt image. And when you can do that, you basically have done a tomographic reconstruction. 
Um, I think the, the main difference is that in, for example, the Eman2 approach, you're able to leverage the information from the object itself rather than from your overall alignment in fiducials, which allows you to bootstrap your way into a very fine, very local um, reconstruction of the subregions. Yes, but even in that approach, you first need to have a rough um, 3D alignment in order to pick the positions in XYZ to then go back. But in order to say yes, I think that is definitely something we, we should think about. It's also something we have thought about of 2D template matching is basically if we can basically merge tomography and 2D template matching by doing 2D template matching on the individual tilt images, in which case, yes, then we could directly merge them into a subtomogram pipeline and then later on use that information to very accurately get a tomogram at the end out of it. So um, it's very interesting. Yeah. Thank you. Any other questions? questions? You see the message from Mary, Jason? Yeah. yeah, regarding the selected array of spots, is it possible to design non-circular regions to reduce overlapping regions? Yes, I think, of course, you want to avoid overlap, but on the same time, if you avoid the overlap too much, you will get regions that have not been imaged at all. And of course, that might be a trade-off you're willing to make if you want to just collect as much data as possible. And I've actually used it that way to basically, again, make the beam bigger than the camera and then just increase the spacing of the hexagonal pattern to basically make sure um, you don't get any overlap between images and then very quickly acquire all this data with beam image shift, which gives you a lot of data really, really fast. But again, then, you don't have that advantage of having data for every pixel of your lamella, basically. Uh, I had a question here, a message um, about Serial EM, just practically, are the features that you're using available in the newest version of Serial EM, specifically uh, the all positions then tilts um, feature for collecting tomography data? Um, I mean, I'm using the Python interface, which is available in the newest better of Serial EM. I don't have a special Serial EM version, but of course, a lot of that stuff is Python code I wrote that then interacts with Serial EM. And I haven't made that public yet, but um, if you want it, shoot me an email, I'll, I'll give it to you. I'll just wanna make sure it will not destroy your microscope before I <laughs> send it out. Yeah, that seems good. Any other questions? All right, great. Well, uh, thank you everyone for joining. Johannes, thank you very much. Uh, that was fantastic talk. Uh, only 32 GPUs for seven days. <laughs> so, uh, it's incredible. Like, yeah, I thought I noticed my lights dim. You know, I think it was like back when you were running that analysis. That's, uh, that's fantastic, so. Uh, great. And thank you everyone for joining. Be sure to, um, I think Peter's got tonight's talk up here, but uh, be sure to check sbgrid.org website for the seminars coming up. Lots of good stuff. Uh, uh, that's it. Thank you for joining. And thank you, Johannes. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thanks, everybody.